I'd like to take a few moments and share with you something very important to we as a people of God. Many years ago, the prophet Isaiah, speaking for God, said, Come, let us reason together. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be as crimson, they shall be as wool. We want these sessions that are going to follow to be a point of reasoning, a time when you think together with God about something that has occurred in your life, something in the past. Think of memories for a moment, memories from the past. They can either be a blessing or a curse, a friend or a foe. They can gladden the heart or they can make you sad. We want to fasten upon a memory that can be precious to you, a resource for your fight of faith for your resistance of Satan and your quest for heaven. We're going to be talking about your baptism into Christ Jesus and of the value that it has obtained before God, of the great benefits that became yours in Christ Jesus. Your baptism is something good and is consistently associated with benefits and blessings in the Word of God. So come, let us reason for the next few weeks concerning your baptism into Christ Jesus and of the blessings that attended it and the benefits that became yours when you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine and were baptized into Christ Jesus. Now, the concept of baptism has been introduced and developed by God himself. It's not something anchored in tradition, not something that has obtained its value by the thoughts and views of men. God himself developed the idea, the concept, the thought of baptism. And when you think about it, we want you to learn to think about it as God himself thinks about it. By his revelation, God molds the thoughts of believers. And if God can mold your thought life, you can have fellowship with him and be pleasing in his sight. Our objective in this series of lessons is not to answer every question about baptism. We don't have time for that, and I'm not sure it would be of good benefit to you. But our purpose is to build your confidence, to build your assurance in the living God, knowing this, that if you're confident that you belong to God and God belongs to you and that you're in Christ Jesus, you'll be able to overcome the world and to resist the devil and in the end to gain heaven. Think of this, that Jesus was introduced to the world by John the baptizer. Oh, a significant term. John the Baptist the baptizer sent of God to introduce the world to Jesus Christ. In Matthew, the third chapter, in verse 1, we're introduced to John the baptizer. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew, the 11th chapter, verses 11 and 12, we learn more about John the Baptist and his mission. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not arisen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Up until the Lord Jesus Christ, John the Baptist was the greatest of all prophets, and his greatest mission was to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ, to make straight his paths and make the world ready for him. It's interesting to observe how God chose to prepare the way for Jesus Christ by sending someone noted for being a baptizer, someone who came, as John the first chapter in verse 31 states, baptizing with water. Have you thought about that? That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, your Savior, was introduced to the world by being baptized. What a value that places upon baptism. Even in the very beginning, baptism was associated with remission of sins. Even John the Baptist's baptism. In Mark, the first chapter, in verse 4, we read that he baptized with the baptism unto the remission of sins. So from the very beginning, with John the Baptist, who heralded the way for the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ's harbinger, or forerunner, the one that prepared the hearts of men for Christ, God associated baptism in water with the remission of sins. Now, you must make this association. Baptism is not just something that you did, not just something to which you submitted. It is an ordinance ordained by God with thoughts and concepts centered about it that have been developed 
by God himself. This was God's way of preparing the world for salvation. You recall in the book of Luke, the first chapter, verses 68 through 80, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, prophesied about the ministry of John and the consequent salvation that would come to the world. Some of the key words that he used in his prophecy are found in this first chapter of Luke and verse 68, where he blessed the Lord God of Israel who hath visited and redeemed his people Israel. In verse 69, he states that God raised up a horn of salvation and that John the Baptist was a forerunner of one that would deliver us and save us from our enemies that we might serve God without fear. Uh, Jesus Christ introduced to the world by John the baptizer who prepared the world to serve God and to have sins remitted. You may recall the account when Jesus was baptized is found in Matthew, the third chapter, and verses 13 through 17, and a review of that will help to bolster your confidence as we hear Jesus Christ himself responding to the fact of baptism. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What a dramatic account. John the Baptist, Jesus' own cousin, as you may recall, knew Jesus as a man, but did not know him as the Son of God. And when Jesus came to him to be baptized, John insisted, oh, I am not worthy to baptize you. You must baptize me. But Jesus responded, No. Do not stop this, John. Submit to this, for it becomes us. It's becoming for us to do what's right, to fulfill all righteousness. You heard it from the mouth of Jesus himself. This is right to be baptized. It is not wrong. Nowhere in all of God's word is baptism associated with being wrong. It's associated with being right. And it was at Jesus Christ's baptism, when he went down into the water, and came up out of the water that for the first time in many years the heavens were split and the voice of the Almighty uttered from heaven, this is my beloved son, this one that has just been baptized is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And may I add a note of confidence for you, child of God, that have been baptized into Christ. It may have been many years ago or it may be recently. God was pleased with you when you were baptized too. He was pleased with you that you fulfilled all righteousness. Now, the Word of God makes several associations with baptism. Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, associated baptism with salvation. The text is found in Mark, the 16th chapter, and verse 16. You may be familiar with it, but let us go over it again and see this wonderful association. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, there's a divine commitment. Jesus Christ has made a commitment. It is true. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, have you thought about salvation and of its centrality in the Scriptures? Everywhere in the Word of God salvation is talked about. It is central. It is never a peripheral issue. It's never off on the side, never incidental, never something secondary. It's always fundamental. I recall the time when the angel from heaven came to Mary, the mother of our Lord, and said to her that she was going to have a son begotten by the Holy Spirit of God. And he said, He shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. 
On another occasion in Luke the ninth chapter in verse 56, Jesus Christ announced his mission. He associated it with salvation. He said, the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Jesus Christ came to save men's lives. Well, if you're a member of the race of man, if you're of the race of Adam, Jesus came to save you, and he has associated your baptism with that salvation. In another place, Jesus said, John the 12th chapter in verse 47, he said, If any man hear my word and do it not, I judge him not. For I am not come to judge the world, but that the world through me might be saved. So this day, today, before Jesus comes again, before the world comes to a close, before time, the curtain of time is brought down, this is the time of salvation, the time when the Son of God has come to save men's lives. I think of a great saying of the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy, the first chapter in verse 15. And let me bear it down upon your conscience. It's something you need to know and need to think about. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now this is a faithful saying. There's not an angel in heaven, nor a demon in hell, nor a man on earth that can alter it. It's a divine commitment. It cannot be changed. And it's worthy of all acceptation. It's worthy of you receiving, worthy of you accepting. You are no more right than when you accept this saying, this divine articulation, if you please, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now you will note very carefully that our text tells us that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That is the point at which you become associated with the salvation which Jesus Christ came to deliver. Now notice the situation. A man had fallen and had come short of the glory of God. That dreadful day in the Garden of Eden when Satan appeared to Eve and enticed her to look upon the tree and to take of the forbidden fruit. The race of mankind fell and plummeted down away from the living God. A wall was erected between man and God. He could not come close to him. He was irreconciled. He was an enemy of God. He didn't think like God, didn't see things like God, was afraid to approach unto God. But praise God, Jesus came into the world to remedy that situation. There's none other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ came into the world to remedy what happened back there in the garden. There are basically two gardens in time. One is in Eden and one is in Gethsemane. And the race of man was in the balance in both gardens. In the Garden of Eden, the race fell and sin entered into the world, and death by sin. But in Gethsemane, oh, think about it, in Gethsemane, salvation began to be wrought for mankind. The word of the Lord tells us that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the good news, the message of Jesus, and what he has accomplished and what he's done. For that gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That's God's objective. That's Christ's objective, to save mankind. In 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, in verse 2, the apostle gives the most wonderful word to us. And let me encourage you to apply this to yourself and your own acceptance before God in Christ Jesus. For he saith, that is God, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We have here an explanation of salvation itself, insight into what it means to be saved. To be saved is not just merely a change in status. It's an enjoyment of unspeakable benefits. God says in the day of salvation, he hears us. He hears us in a time accepted. That is, he accepts our person. We're no longer cut off from God, no longer cast away from God, no longer sinning and coming short of the glory of God so as to be cut off from him. 
Now we are accepted in Christ Jesus. That's the proclamation of Ephesians 1 and verse 6. And he says, in a time of salvation, he succors us, he feeds us, nourishes us, gives us sustenance and divine strength. Friend, God has what you need. And this is the day, the day of Christ, when he's giving those things to people. He has associated that with salvation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, shall come into this association with God where he is heard and where he is fed and strengthened and nourished. Oh, what a blessed thing you have in your baptism. Think of the centrality of salvation again and associate it with the grace of God. In Titus, the second chapter and verse 11, the word of God tells us this, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Now salvation has been brought into the world by the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and truth has come by him, John writes in John the first chapter. And this salvation is appropriated by your obedience to the gospel. Jesus, remember, made this association. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And the grace of God which bringeth salvation then becomes associated with the person that is baptized. God's grace brings nothing bad. It brings every good and perfect gift down from God to you. The grace of God which bringeth salvation. Now I'm showing at this point that salvation is absolutely central in Scripture. It's never a secondary matter. Never out on the edge of discipleship. Not something just for the beginning of your association with God and then to be abandoned. Salvation is what it's all about. Think of this statement of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the captain of our salvation. Hebrews, the second chapter in verse 11. That is to say, Jesus Christ has charge of getting you from earth to heaven, of taking you from here to there. He is the captain of of salvation and your baptism has brought you under his captainship you are under Christ Jesus and being brought to heaven if you have been baptized in Christ Jesus it's so important dear believer that you know that that you understand that in your heart that you're under the headship of Jesus Christ he has been by God given personal charge of you and his responsibility is to get you to heaven our responsibility is to get you to go on your way rejoicing. Another thought about Jesus Christ is spoken in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, and verse 9. Now, in this particular text, Jesus Christ is described as the author and the finisher of our salvation. Think of that. The author of your salvation, he starts it. He begins it. He initiates it. He gets it underway. And he's the finisher. He brings it to a culmination. Your only job is to make sure you trust in him, lean to him, and let nothing separate you from him. To not be deceived by the tempter into leaving him. Now, one of your chief resources is your baptism. In your baptism, you were associated with Jesus Christ's salvation. And as you look upon it in that manner and rest upon it and have confidence in what God has committed himself to do in your baptism, Jesus Christ will actually and experientially bring you from earth to heaven in the joy of the Lord. I trust that you know that the blessings uh, that come to God's people are things that attend or accompany salvation. The central issue is salvation. In Hebrews, the sixth chapter and verse nine, the apostle said, that he was confident that they would have the things that accompany salvation. Now you have been brought by baptism into a realm of salvation, a divine association with salvation. And as such, the things that accompany salvation are yours. Go on your way rejoicing, fellow believer, as you contemplate your baptism. You know, Peter announced in 1 Peter, the first chapter and verse 9, that the very end of our faith is the salvation of our souls. That is the objective of our faith. The reason for believing is the salvation of our souls. Your believing brought you to baptism, your baptism into Christ that uh, connected you with this salvation. 
Your baptism has been joined to these realities we've been talking about the great salvation of God, the things that accompany it, all of the spiritual benefits and blessings, the hearing of God, the succor and strength of God, the leading of the Lord Jesus Christ from earth to heaven, the beginning and the finishing of your salvation. All of these things have been connected with your baptism. It has been associated with these realities. Now think of this again in Mark 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Saved. That's what Jesus came to do. That's what he's the captain of. That's what he's pioneering now. He's bringing men from earth to heaven, saving them, and that work has been associated with your baptism. Peter said a remarkable thing in 1 Peter, the third chapter, verses 18 through 21. In this text, he announces to us that baptism actually saves us. Now, if you've been in Christ for any length of time, you are no, no doubt aware that there are many that say baptism does not save us. It's very important to me, as someone who's instructing you about these things, that you let no man rob you of the benefit of your salvation. You have been baptized into Christ and Jesus himself, the head of the church, the Son of God, the captain of our salvation said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now think of Peter's words and how they tie in with this. First Peter the third chapter and verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if you'll note that particular text, there's a parenthetical statement there. Uh, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. The meaning of this passage parallels the old covenant policy of diverse washings. They're mentioned in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, in verse 9. The Old Testament, the old covenant, the law of Moses stood in diverse or different types of washings and cleansings. Now, what Peter is saying here is our baptism into Christ is not that sort of thing. It was not a mere empty ceremony, not a ritual. It is associated with the resurrection of Christ and consequently with salvation. And because of that, your baptism saves you. It connects you with the commitment of the living God. Now let's review briefly what we have discussed in this first lesson. Your baptism is associated with salvation. God has made the association through his son, Jesus Christ. He did it by preparing the way for Jesus to come into the world by John the baptizer. John was noted for baptizing people, and he was sent to baptize people so that he could introduce Jesus to the world through baptism. Jesus, when he was brought up out of the water, uh, God confirmed his sonship and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This association of God's good pleasure with Jesus in Jesus' baptism is something we must not permit to be taken from you. Take a hold of this, believer. Grasp it with all of your faith. This was a time when God spoke at a time of baptism, and he probably spoke to your heart, too, during that time. In the book of uh, Luke, the seventh chapter, in verse 29, those that were baptized by John, it said of them that they justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. That is to say, they sided with God. They vindicated God. They proved that God was overall by being baptized by John. Now, if this was true of those who submitted to John's baptism, how much more is it true of you that have submitted to Christ Jesus' baptism? You have justified God in your baptism. You have proven and demonstrated to the world that God is true and that the commitment that he has made in Christ Jesus meant something to you and you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine that was delivered unto you. Heaven recognized your baptism. You must recognize the validity of it too. 
Think of how our Lord Jesus Christ himself submitted to be baptized. And if you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you must submit to be baptized also. God forbid that anyone that wants to be a follower of Jesus would hesitate to do what he did. Note that he said to be baptized was to fulfill all righteousness. The difference, of course, between you and the Lord Jesus, you were baptized for the remission of your sins. You were baptized in order to be saved. Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. He did not balk or draw back or withdraw from any of God's divine ordinances, thereby leaving us a pattern that we should follow in his steps. And lastly, Jesus Christ himself associated baptism with salvation. We do not have to guess at this point. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Oh, it's a wonderful truth. Your evidence of participation in salvation is actually something that you did. Believer, it's probably the only thing you ever did 100%. It was right the day you were baptized. It was right your action when you submitted to be baptized. That day when you went down into the water and came up out of the water, the God of heaven associated your act with salvation. God does not question your salvation. Why should you question it? Jesus does not question it. You should receive it. You should learn to look back upon it, reason upon it, and cherish it. The consciousness of salvation can come to you by a conscious association of the act of obedience to which you submitted with the commitment that God himself has made. Now I exhort you and challenge you to look at your baptism, to consider it, to value it, and to capitalize upon it. And remember the words of Jesus, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved.